Hello and welcome to Code with Sar. I'm Sar. How are you doing today? We're going to talk about custom eye locker this time. We needed a custom eye locker in Code MK because we are iterating it to support Android. We are reusing most of the code for Windows, and those codes use the eye locker with a custom eye locker provider for Android. I bridge up the eye locker to the LockCat, and this is how it looks like. There's a lot of information in LockCat. If we search for the proper tag, aka category name in the eye locker, we can find the proper lock message. And that is very useful when debugging on a new platform. In this video, I'm going to show you step by step how to write the custom eye locker provider. We're going to get us started by build a bare bone minimum custom eye locker. That one is going to output the content to a file. And once you know those steps, you're going to know how to build it for the Android by yourself. And in the next video, we're going to talk about more advanced scenarios, many ways to customize the settings, and so on and so forth. Now, let's dive in. Let's start by creating two projects. A class library to demo the build of a custom eye locker, and a web API to demo the usage. Bring them up in VS Code. Our goal is to extend the eye locker. So we need to depend on the package Microsoft extensions, logging, abstractions. Now the core of writing a custom eye locker is to implement eye locker interface. Let's create a class for it. As you can see, there are three core methods. Begin scope is enabled and lock. Again, we're targeting a bare bone implementation. We do not even need to worry about begin scope. That is actually not 100% accurate. Even if we are not supporting scope, we cannot just leave the method slow. It's best to just return a useless eye disposable. That's what I checked in the repository. With regarding its enabled, this is what I recommend at this moment. As long as the lock level is not none, we treat it as enabled. Here I want to call out, because this is a common misunderstanding, that we don't need to worry about the lock level setting the configuration and the lock level by the API at this moment. It is handled and you'll see in the demo. But for now, let's just focus on the minimum. The lock method. This is a kernel of iLocker. It doesn't matter which method you call, should it be lock information, lock warning, lock arrow, it end up here. This is where we should spend time on. We want to opt the lock into a file, so let's open the file first. I'm going to hard code the file name for a bit, and then I'm going to create a stream writer. Actually, this is going to write the file from the beginning again and again. Let me quickly fix it by providing a file model by append. Here we go. Imagine we open the file. What do we need to do then is feed the content to it, right? Where do we get the content? I guess it would be something on the parameter list. What do you think? Some of them are obvious. Block level, event ID, but what is state? Exception is easy to understand, but notice it is optional. And then we have a delegate called for matter. Well, it happens to take in a state and an optional exception, which then returns the string as a result. Hmm. Let's take the risk to use the output of the formatter as a content. Risky. Okay, that's pretty much it. We got the core of the NiLocker. They guarantee you. If we create an instance of my logger and try to use it, it's going to work. If you want to try that by yourself, I just created this uh, console my logger project. I'll push it into the repository and share a tag with me so that you can have some first hand experience. That said, there is the one big piece that is missing, and I'm going to talk about that. We just built the core of a custom my logger. It works, but it's not a good experience for people who want to use it with the dependency injection. Remember how do you add a console iLocker provider? You just call add console on the locker builder. And we are missing pieces for my locker to do the same. And that's what we're going to look into. The first thing that is needed is a locker provider. Let's create one. Same routine to let the editor generate the implementation for me. Okay, we have two methods to deal with. Create a locker by category name, 
And that is pulse method from idisposable. Now generally, I don't like interface that implements idisposable because it feels like you are forcing the implementation to take idisposable. Unfortunately, I cannot control idlockup provider, so I'll go with it. Let's seal the class so that we don't need to worry about the inheritance for idisposable. How do we create a locker by category name? Here's my version. I'm going to use a concurrent dictionary. I'll use category name as the keys, and I lockers as the values. Whenever create locker is called, if the I locker for the category exists, it will be returned from the dictionary. Otherwise, the factory delegate will be called to create a new instance, save it to the dictionary, and get it returned. Concurrent dictionary is not an I disposable. We don't have to do anything in the dispose method. I'm going to leave dispose empty. That is my locker provider. Now let's see how is it used. By convention, locker provider is usually used along with iLocking Builder, which is an interface in another package, Microsoft the extensions the locking. So let's add a reference to it. Now let's create an extension method. It will be used to extend iLocking Builder to provide a method to register my locker provider. That is the one that we usually call to add locking providers. Like add console, add debug. We are output to a file. So I'm going to call it to add file. Builder.service is the service collection. We're adding one provider into the collection. And we use try add enumerable. Try add enumerable takes in a service descriptor. Service descriptor decides the lifetime for the service to be singleton here. The service type of iLocker provider, the implementation of my locker provider. We return the builder when we are done. At this moment, we have all three pieces an iLocker, an iLocker provider, and an extension method. Next, let's see how these three pieces work together to provide a complete iLocker experience. We created this uh, use customer iLocker web API at the very beginning of the tutorial, and now it's time to put it into use. First thing first, add a reference to the class library. Here's how to customize the locking builder. On the service collection, we call add locking. We get hands on a locking builder. I'm clear the pre baked providers that is not required, but we may call it debugging idea. And then we could call the extension method that we wrote a little while ago. It's not there in the intelligence. That's because we haven't used the namespace yet. And here we go. Let's see then how is it used. In this weather forecast controller, iLogger is injected. What happens behind the scenes? is that the iLocker factory is going to go over all the registered iLocker provider and the request for an instance of the iLocker for the current category. And in this case, the category name is going to be weather forecast controller's full name. Now, remember, we registered our iLocking provider as iInnumerable. So behind every locker instance, this is actually a series of loggers. Come back to the code. We're going to log our first piece of information, content as uh, hello, my first information. Well, actually, let's make it more fun by adding a timestamp on it. And let's run it. First thing you're going to notice is this uh, output.log shows up immediately. Let's take a look at what's in it. Those are system logs. Now let's try to invoke the weather forecast web API. It seems like it's working pretty well. Not only that, it works to alter content into a file. This simple implementation also supports filters by level and by category. Let's try it out. If 
Firstly, let me set the default level to warning. Then I'm going to log warning, following the information in weather forecast. Let's try run it again. Notice that only warnings are locked. Now let's add a rule to the category. And this is going to set the use custom iLogger controllers category back to information. Let's quickly run it. Now, every time I refresh a page, it is two log entries, one for information, one for warning. So as long as you build the iLogger this way, you get this for free. And that is how you implement a custom iLogger. I hope you enjoy that. Like the video to let me know. Oh, by the way, I'm trying to come up with some hands-on lab experience. Find all the details in the description. And I hope those are going to give you more understanding about the topic. We're going to talk more advanced scenarios in the next video. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel so that you know when it becomes available. All right, my friend, keep coding, keep improving. And I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care.